Here's what you can look forward to on this episode of the Nice Guys on Business. No great business gets built by a single individual, right? There's always a team. Uh, sometimes they, they may not be in the spotlight, but they're there. And the team has to feel like they have the freedom to innovate, to problem solve. And they're not tied to the tracks of this business plan that was written when the concept was different and the understanding of the market was incomplete and so forth. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. And greed, you mark my words, will not only save Teldar paper, but also the nice guys on business. Go from where you are now to where you could be. Get expert tips to grow your business, to be more productive and more efficient. Whether you're trying to build influence, grow your community, or make it rain. Best-selling author of Nice Guys Finish First, Doug Sandler, can lead the way. The Nice Guys on Business is produced by Turnkey Podcast Productions. Now, here's your host, Doug Sandler. Jack Plotkin is the CEO of Cardinal Solutions, a boutique advisory and investment firm based in New York City, educated at Harvard and, and uh, fortified on Wall Street. Wow, he's definitely got the experience. Jack has more than two decades of experience at the crossroads of business and technology and has advised more than 100 Fortune 500 firms across all major industries. If you're looking for inspiration and advice on growth strategies, venture capital, or simply need to stay uh, accountable to a pro and get advice today, you're in the right place. Welcome, Jack, to the Nice Guys on Business podcast. Excited to have you here, Jack. And I'm equally excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I, I saw in some of the some of the information that you had sent over, and we do a lot of this nice guy community. You may not be familiar with how we how our interview process or application process goes, but uh, Jack was nice enough to to sponsor this episode. And what's really cool about it, as he was sending information over, a lot of the stuff was related to to movies that he sent. And you know, me and Strickland, if you if you've had a chance to listen to Strick on the show, Nice Guy Community, you'll know that Strick is definitely a movie buff. And I just kind of trail on to the conversation with him because I think it's kind of fun. But Jack, so tell me about this. It sounds like you've put together, you've, you've starred, directed, produced every, what, what have you not done in the movie business? I love this. Or what have you done in the movie business? Yeah. So, so, you know, one of the, one of the questions um, on this topic is, is am I going to be talking about it as sort of a, as a business guy or as a movie guy? Right. And, exactly. Uh, Great. And we love to categorize people, right? I mean, it, it's a hard, it's hard for us to categorize ourselves. We're really good at categorizing other people. So, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Okay. So my business guy or movie guy, I think, I think I'm both literally and figuratively. So I literally made a movie, uh, wrote, produced, directed, acted in a feature length film. We put together crew, we put together a cast, we had uh, auditions, the whole nine yards. Um, we had uh, location shots around New York city, permission from the mayor's office. So, wow. so pretty much all of the pieces, it wasn't a big budget film, but it had all of the pieces you would expect uh, as part of a feature length film. Um, I think that uh, on the other side, um, you know, I've, I've obviously, most of my career has been in business, uh, both at advising and investing in startups and entrepreneurs. Um, but I, I actually think that every successful business executive, every successful entrepreneur, has the makings of a movie maker, mm -hmm. and every successful movie, movie maker has to understand business. Uh, so George Lucas had a great quote about this. He said, the secret to the movie business, or any business, is to get a good education in a subject other than film. It could be history, it could be psychology, economics, architecture, but you need something to make a movie about. And all the skill in the world isn't going to help you unless you have something to say. And so I think people who build businesses outside the movies definitely had something to say. Alexander Graham Bell had something to say about how we say something to each other. Henry Ford, Wright Brothers, they had something to say about how we get around. Steve Jobs certainly had something to say about how we interact with technology. So I think both movies and business are ways to get your ideas into the world and, and ways, hopefully, to make the world a better place. 
So I see common motivations and, and common skill sets there. So at the end of the day, maybe we don't have to categorize ourselves as just one or the other. There is a lot of crossover. And I appreciate your, your analogy between, uh, between movies and, and business. And let's even draw a closer line if we could, because I think oftentimes people will listen to a show, this show specifically, and maybe they find some entertainment value, but they want to be able to pull like you know, really good practical action items that they can use in their business every day. So help me by making some, and we can use the, the, the movie analogy. I think it's great. I mean, you have a leading man, you have a script, you have all of the components of making the movie, the production, the executive production, the money that's involved in it. I do see a lot of parallels, but can you, can you draw a parallel between making a movie and building a startup itself? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and you're hitting the nail on the head. I mean, you know, the, a lot of those things are, are very much in common. Most people actually don't realize, but every movie is a startup. It could be a small budget indie film or, or a big studio blockbuster, but they both start the same way. Some type words, on a few dozen sheets of paper called a script. It's all you got. There's no team, no office, no business plan, no mm -hmm. website, no marketing, right? Just a script. Then a producer, that's your entrepreneur, has to put the whole thing together. Bring in a director, actors, crew, equipment, sets, wardrobe, post-production team, distribution, marketing, all the pieces. Mm -hmm. And once the movie is done, the entire scaffolding, it's taken down and all you've got are, are the residuals hopefully uh, from the film and, and that's assuming people actually watch your movie and, and like any business that's the real test the movie is your product audience is your customer there's no audience then your movie is dead on arrival so every movie is a startup but it also goes the other way as you pointed out building a startup is kind of like making a movie the business plan is your script the engineers are your crew, the salespeople are your actors, the office is your set, marketing is your marketing, and the customer is your audience. And I think that anybody who has worked in both movies and startups uh, will tell you the parallels are, are really remarkable. And, uh, and so we can talk, for example, about, um, we can start by talking about uh, what movies have to teach us about creating a business plan. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the most natural equivalent to the business plan in the movie world is a script. Business plans and scripts provide a plan for what we're going to create, how we're going to create it, and the roles required. They both provide an overall framework and direction, but are open to strategic revision and tactical interpretation. And they both require effective execution to take their driving idea from theory to practice. In my experience, many of the elements of a great script translate remarkably well to business plans. So for example, great script is easy to read, highly captivating. Should your business plan be easy to read and captivating? Well, if you want potential investors and team members to not just struggle through, but actually like it and even be inspired by it, I would say definitely. Great. Let me ask you, also provide. Yeah, yeah. Go well, ahead. Let me. I mean, just uh, it, let me just throw something in here for a second. A lot of times, and again, I I know that there is probably a lot of um, pivoting as you're putting a movie together. There's a lot of moving parts at the same time. Very similar to to uh, to starting a business. Um, oftentimes, I find that the folks that that I have had a chance to work with and those that have communicated with in our community. Um, I don't want to say that they go at it haphazardly. That's not a way that that's not a great way <laughs> to explain or, or to, to, uh, to kind of describe the, 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 the forward growth of a business. But oftentimes we are fly, we are building the plane as we are flying it. And I want to just make sure that my, my community is comfortable with the fact that, Hey, even though you have a business plan, you're not going to know all of the answers until you start to you know, run into some of the hiccups along the way. I'm assuming very similar to a, a movie, that would be the case as well. Oh, that, that's hugely important, right? A lot of people, I think, overproduce, over manufacture the business plan. They try to, to think of every possible scenario. They, they come up with some 200 page document and, and literally, a, a, you know, business plan is not worth its weight in paper. It's actually the opposite. Usually the more paper, the, the less useful the business plan is because uh, you, you have to leave 
the tactical execution open to interpretation, right? So a script, for example, would tell you that a scene has taken place outside, would tell you it's daytime, okay? But it's up to the crew, up to the director, to uh, the location team to actually select the place, design the location uh, or the set. Or the script might tell you a character is walking in or out of a, of a room, but it's up to the director to decide if the, the character is going to walk toward the camera, away from the camera. So I think this very much applies to the business plan. It should provide a strategic framework, um, but the tactical execution has to be open to interpretation, open to that all-important ability to make adjustments and to pivot, because you know there's the other side of it is if you spend all this time creating this massive 200 page business plan you're going to have a hard time deviating from it mm -hmm. even when the market is clearly telling you that that that's not the direction right so you have to remain open to feedback and, and finally you have to trust your team you're going to have no, no great business gets built by a single individual right if there's always a team uh, sometimes they they may not be in the spotlight but but they're there and the team has to feel like they have the freedom to innovate to problem solve and they're not tied to the tracks of this business plan that was written when the concept was different and and the understanding of the market was incomplete and so forth so talk to me about the beginning part of somebody getting started in business again we have a lot of people that are in our community that may be one foot in the door of the company that they're working for in in the corporate sector and they say hey i really want to be able to do something similar on my own you know in Instead of just sitting down and writing out a business plan, or maybe that is the advice that you would give them, what is the what what is an action item that you would say as somebody is thinking about building a business outside of their you know of their regular day gig right now and trying to create this something out of the side hustle that they have working? Yeah, sure. So I think a business plan is important, but it doesn't have to be this traditional massive document. You, you want to put down on paper generally what are you building. Right, so you want to hit on some basics. What are you building? Um, how are you going to build it, more or less? Maybe some some sense of timeline. How are you going to go to market? How you what what is the customer segment you're going after? Uh, a little bit of research uh, helps. Um, and and again, you don't have to necessarily write it all down, but you should definitely do some research. Are there competitors that are already doing this? Um, and if not, why not? Uh, so, so that's some of the work you want to do up front because you don't want to just, you know, wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to build a social network just like Facebook without realizing that Facebook is already out there. So <laughs> it, it, it's, you know, it's certainly very important to do um, enthusiasm is critical, right? But it has to be tempered by some homework. Now you've done a bit of homework uh, and you have something along the lines of a business plan. You're going to need two things. Right. And it's the same again for movies and for startups. You're going to need capital and you're going to need a team. Your, your team could be small, but the most successful businesses generally have a core team of somewhere between two and, and four people. You get, you, you know, one person, it's hard because you don't have a sounding board, somebody that's going to point out the errors of your ways and suggest things you haven't considered. You get beyond four, you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen. They all feel like they have equal say, and it's difficult to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, so that's now, if, even if you're going to make, uh, you know, a, a very, very simple movie, right? You're going to make one uninterrupted selfie video using your iPhone. Well, you still need capital, which is the cost of your iPhone, and you still need a team, which is essentially you, mm -hmm. right? You may be able to swing that on your savings, but for most movies, you're going to need a little more. The same applies to most businesses. Now, of course, the natural question is, okay, great, how do I do that, right? How do I raise capital and build a team effectively? And, and again, does the movie industry have anything to say about that? Well, actually it does. So I think raising capital is all about the story and the vision. Most investors won't necessarily bother to read a massive document or in the case of the film business read even the entire script right so you have to condense everything into a compelling elevator pitch we hear a lot about elevator pitches but uh that's because they're important they work we, we live in a soundbite society 
And, uh, and so it's important to be able to very succinctly state, okay, here is what it is and here's why it's important. Um, in the film business, we see that a lot of movies, new movies get pitched as a cross between two other movies, right? So you could imagine, I'm making this up, but you could imagine Pirates of the Caribbean, for example, being pitched as Princess Bride meets Hook or <laughs> Die Hard being pitched as Towering Inferno meets Commando, mm -hmm. right? Or The Born Identity, Total Recall meets Three Days of the Condor. These are powerful pitches because they take two ideas you know really well, they combine them in a totally unexpected way, right? And they bring it to life. They engage you. Once you're engaged, now you're willing to hear the rest of the pitch, okay? You may be willing to, to read that script or, or read the business plan. And so that's where the story now comes in. If the story is compelling, then investors go from wondering whether the movie should be made or the, the business should be built. And now they go to wondering how should we make the movie or build the business, right? And, and that's the key turning point. Uh, that, that's where you, you really kind of grab their attention. Now they become allies rather than skeptics. And, and now they're on your side saying, okay, you got me. This makes sense. Now, how do we execute? How do we actually make it a reality? Uh, and, and the second part is, is having a team. And these go hand in hand. So you can have a great story, but investors don't want to back a story in a vacuum. And you may be the, you know, the, the greatest person in the world, but you know, investors think, okay, what if you get hit by a bus tomorrow? God forbid. Something happens, right? I can't just put all my eggs in the basket of, of a single individual. You're going to be the key entrepreneur but what's the team around you look like? And so in the film business, this is addressed by packaging. Producers will package a script with a director and, and oftentimes a star. Actually, Mike Ovitz and CAA, they kind of really pioneered this concept of packaging. And it really, it, it works because if you have any, any weaknesses in the, in the business plan or in the story, the team makes up for it and vice versa. So take a script like Magic Mike, right? When you have Steven Soderbergh and Channing Tatum attached, it's a much easier sell than just to say, oh yeah, I have a script about essentially uh, a male exotic dancer. Uh, same for a script like Collateral, right? Well, another script about uh, an assassin, okay? There's a lot of movies like that, but when you have Michael Mann and you have Tom Cruise attached, that's exciting. Right. So, if you're able to bring somebody in, right, and you have to kind of shake your relationship tree, right, you might have to, to do a little work in terms of getting to somebody who has that wow factor, who, who has been successful in business. Hopefully, they've actually been successful in an area that's very important to what you're trying to build. And you get them on board, you might have to give up a little equity. That's okay. It's worth it because it gives you a lot of credibility and they've been there, they've done that. You can leverage that experience and potential investors are going to see that and say, okay, well, you know, now this is a lot more compelling. I like the story. I like the team and, and it becomes a lot more of a no brainer to invest. And, uh, and obviously it's not just about investment, but setting yourself up for success. Great story, great team sets you up for success. So uh, I was going to ask you about that because I know that uh, whether you or partners that you work with are, are also into the idea of uh, doing some angel investing in, in some startups. Um, is that what you look for? Do you look for interesting, interesting plot line, uh, a, a really high level people that are a, a part of the organ? I mean, what are some of the things that you actually look at when you go to determine whether you're going to uh, invest in an organization or not in their early stages? Because I mean, it's some crazy number, something like 90 or 95% of them, probably even more fail in the first 12 months. Yeah. Well, and I think those statistics are misleading actually, because the, a lot fail because a lot should have never been started in the first place. <laughs> True. Right. That that's the truth. I mean, if, if you're going to, if you're going to kind of, you know, walk off a cliff, chances are you're going to fall and, and it's going to be a bad outcome. So um, what, the, you know, a lot of VCs, they play a numbers game. If you hit certain numbers in terms of your, your top line or your bottom line, uh, usually top line at that point, if you're hitting um, certain projections 
and you're in certain sectors, they'll throw money at you. And then, you know, out of 10 bets or 100 bets, some number, some small number work out and they make, they make back everything they lose on the other ones plus. Right. Well, wh- I think that, you know, that works for VCs. My approach to investing, and, and I think the most successful angels take the same approach, is, is to invest in fewer businesses, but to be very thoughtful what you're investing in. And here, I would say that um, I look for entrepreneurs that are fully, completely committed all in, uh, not, not necessarily, to me, all in doesn't mean that they have to have quit their job. In fact, uh, a lot of the most successful startups are started by people who don't quit their jobs, who do it in their spare right. time. Right, because not, not pressured. That, yeah, no, yeah they're, they're not pressured to make bad short-term decisions. And uh, Let me so, ask you a question. You know, Let me ask you a yeah. question about that just for a second, because maybe it's just from some of my innocence in, the, uh, in how investors work. As someone that invests in organizations and those that are in our in our community certainly have um, you know the power to start up many many smaller companies. Do you take an advisory role as an investor, or do you just play the money man? So, a lot of investors handle this differently. Me personally, I I choose to be a strategic investor, meaning that I want to be hands on. I, I do fewer investments, but I try for the most part, I will do some passive investments in real estate, uh, for example, areas where, which are fairly commoditized and well understood and transactional, but areas where there's really an opportunity to innovate and build something mm-hmm. um, there, I prefer to take a more active role. And my goal isn't to get in the way, right? That, that's, I think an entrepreneur needs to own their business. I think an investor who comes in and takes away so much equity that the entrepreneur or the founding team is not no longer really vested. I think that's, that's a mistake. Um, right. I'd rather have a smaller piece of the pie, but I do want to have a seat at the table so that if I feel like the train is going off the tracks or we could adjust our trajectory. So it's that much higher. Um, I'm able to kind of see it and say it. And, and my opinion is going to be heard. Uh, and some of it is just having been there, done that. You know, as you mentioned, you might have somebody who's worked a corporate job for many years. They may be phenomenal at what they do. They go off and start a business. All of a sudden, it's no longer to, sufficient to be really good at one area. You have to be good across all the different areas of the business. You have to understand sales and marketing. You have to understand operations. You have to understand if it's a tech business, you have to understand the engineering side. You don't have to be an expert, but you have to have enough of an understanding. You have to understand negotiation and contracts and regulatory if it applies and so forth. So there's just a lot of area to cover. And in my experience, a lot of entrepreneurs are very strong in some, much less strong in others. And that's where an advisor who's um, either, either knows or who can connect them with the appropriate expert, somebody that can be trusted, and somebody that won't uh, kind of destroy the business by costing too much, that's where an advisor like that comes in. And what's great is when you invest, your interests are completely aligned, right? So if I'm an investor, I only want you to succeed. I only want you to grow your business. Right. Um, Final point on that, integrity. Um, I think that um, to me and, and in my approach, it's not just about money, right? It's not about the bottom line. To me, there has to be a social impact component. And I think cutting corners and cutting costs, if it, if it goes counter uh, to actually providing excellent customer service and, and doing what you think is right should never be done. And, and it pains me when I see uh, certain types of investors kind of pushing companies to do things against the grain of the integrity and the principles that got them to that level of success in the first place. And yeah. then you see it all the time. I mean, you go to restaurants, right, that open up and it's great and it's wonderful. And you come back a few years later uh, after it's, it's been popular for a while and you're like, this is so strange. It feels like uh, the food has gone downhill. The service has gone downhill. What's going on? And what's going on is that, you know, the, the things that made the place successful in the first place, some of those principles have been abandoned and, and the pressures of cost cutting and other things have kind of taken hold. 
I'm curious because, you know, I just had this conversation yesterday with a business coach and I, and I, um, I didn't really think about it from this perspective until we started talking just today on this interview. But what are some of the symptoms that you might uh, see in an organization or uh, a leader of a, of a new organization of a startup that might be coming to you and saying, you know, I think I want to, um, I want to get some advice. Um, do I need advice from you or do I need you to invest in my organization? And because, you know, this, this one particular coach that I was dealing with, the fee for what he was going to do was going to be about $30,000. And while that is certainly not a, uh, a, you know, a small amount of money, it's, um, it's cheaper than ownership within the company. But some of the things that we want to do as an organization, I'm sure those in our community as well might feel this way, they don't know how to get to the next step. And certainly having someone that has been um, educated at Harvard, has a lot of experience from Wall Street, has a lot of experience as an investor in these organizations, you've seen a lot more than many of the, many of the startups, you know, the leaders of those startups in our, in our community. At what point do you say, hey, you don't need an advisor, you actually need a partner in this, and I want to I wanna help you with that? What are those symptoms? Well, it's interesting. You know, you ask a critical question, and I take a very unorthodox approach to this. Uh, when I'm interested uh, in a particular organization, um, as potentially as an investor, I generally say, look, I, I'm not going to charge you anything, and I'm not going to invest anything. I want us to just start working together. Think of me as an advisor. I'm happy to sign an NDA. We can sign other types of documents to establish the relationship so that you, you're protected and sharing information. Uh, but I want you to get to know me, and I want to get to know you. And after some period of time, we're both going to know if this is a comfortable relationship and how it should be papered. Is right. it, should this be a relationship where there's some advisory shares? Is it an, a financial investment um, for equity or whatever the case may be? It could be convertible, whatever it is. Um, or, or is it actually that um, you may want to either, either it's myself or a member of my team or somebody I, I recommend that you want to retain uh, as a more directly as, as a contractor or as an employee or something like that uh, to, to work for your business. So I, I think that what I would recommend um, is, is a getting to know process, right? And, and uh, you know, a lot of the folks out there that that do this sort of work, they, they become very transactional. So they're like, okay, well, I work with a lot of startups and I'll either take equity or I'll, I'll take cash and, uh, and here are my rates. And, you know, it's difficult in that, in that moment, in that scenario to feel other, anything other than just another number. Okay. So right. they're going to close right. me. They're going to, they're going to give me their, their usual thing. What's, what's the special sauce? If they're just going to give me the same thing they're giving to every other business out there, you know, then the question becomes, do I want that commodity? So the way I think about it is um, if it's just a commodity, you're be better off not giving away too much equity for that. You might have to because you're just strapped for capital. And it's all you have. You might have to give away some equity, but minimize it as much as possible because that commodity Maybe something that gets you from point A to point B, but that's it. That's as far as it's going to get you. On the other hand, you, it's so much more valuable to get somebody whose interests are completely aligned and who wants to actually build the business right. the right. same way you want to build the business. That's the individual or the organization that you want to give equity to, that you want as a partner, but it takes time. So if they're truly interested in your business, they will be willing to invest some time. And that would be my gating criteria. Before so I would, give away a lot of equity. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, so would that be something you'd be open to discussing with somebody in my community that says, hey, I have a great idea. I just don't have the, the business acumen to kind of get me from point A to point B, but I have a great idea. I think this is something that would work. Here's my level of experience. Is that something that you're open to discussing as a part of uh, a conversation with somebody in my community? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so I, I've never in my entire career, I've never, ever had somebody come to me and say, I have a business idea. Can I talk to you about it? And I said, no. Right. I always <laughs> have that conversation. Right. Right. Yeah, always, always. Now, sometimes I may say, look, I personally, right. I don't see that idea 
uh, at this point, you know, working out, right? I may, I may provide some ideas, some suggestions, things like that. It may not be for me. It may not be, it may be a great idea. Mm -hmm. It may not be part of my profile. I'll be very transparent about that. I'm also going to be very honest with my feedback because I think being clear is being kind, right? So I think that uh, when somebody comes to you, um, my goal is never to, I focus on the idea, not the person. So I'll say, look, your enthusiasm and your excitement is not something you ever want to give up. And I never want to affect that in any way, shape or form. But if I think the idea is not necessarily an idea that's likely to succeed, I'm going to be honest about that. And I'm going to give you my reasons and you may disagree. And the best thing you could possibly do is prove me wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. I love that. That, that. That's, that's fantastic. But um, at, by the same token, you know, uh, I think I, I wouldn't have the opportunity to make, uh, to advise or invest if I wasn't open to meeting new entrepreneurs and hearing about their ideas. I would also be just a lot poorer as far as my understanding of right. what's out there, what's happening, what's possible. So uh, absolutely. And, and for me, it's not just, you know, I, I travel, I have a, a trip to Europe coming up. And when I travel, I'll meet with uh, startups in other countries. And that's also very interesting to see kind of uh, what they're doing, what they're up to. In some, some cases, they're a little bit behind some of what we're doing in the U.S. In some cases, they're ahead. And, and there's very interesting kind of cultural tie-ins and things of that nature. So, you know, it's, I, I think we, we get caught up in uh, venture capital and Silicon Valley and all the things that are happening in the U.S., but there's a lot more to it. It also attunes me to a lot of the startups in local communities. There's still a lot of great brick-and-mortar startups, a lot of great local businesses um, that aren't part of the, the whole, you know, Silicon Valley kind of assembly mm -hmm. line. Right. That I think are, are, are actually incredibly vital uh, to our well-being and our social fabric. And, and really, to me, that, that is the American dream is what it's all about. It's about the, the small startups, somebody who, who takes a chance, who just says, I see an opportunity to do something better. They go out, they do it. They build a business around it. It doesn't have to be a huge business. It doesn't have to be a Google or a Facebook. Right. But it's, it's, um, that's not what it's about. Uh, and, and to me, that has always been kind of what makes America special. And, and I certainly hope that that's something that never goes away. Well, I love the idea of uh, having somebody in my community reach out to you and saying, Jack, OK, I want to talk about this. You in engaging or they engaging in your services or they engage in your investment that you that you might be able to uh, participate in their in their growth. And, uh, and having you guys come back and do a case study. We've had a couple of these case studies over the last several years, and they all work out really well. And what's so cool about it is it's documented success, not only for you as, a, as an investor and an advisor, but uh, as, a, as a startup, it's a great way for you to have somebody on your, on your team that actually has the, you know, the, uh, the background to actually help your business grow. Again, would that be something that you would be open to if we can get your phone to ring and somebody actually able to take advantage of somebody's services and, and vice versa? Yeah, hundred percent. You know, I, I, I'm sure you'll, you'll share some of the links. I mean, our website is cardinalsol.com and uh, there's a contact form on there. Uh, Real Jack Plotkin on social media. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I certainly hope that, that some of the listeners will reach out. I'd love to hear what uh, you're up to and, and what you're building or the ideas that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, questions you may have about next steps. So that's something that um, absolutely I would welcome. And if it turns into something that we can actually present as a case study, that would be phenomenal. Love that. That would be, that would be really great. I'd love it. So Nice Guy Community, that is your walking papers today. Make sure you head over to my uh, show notes. You check out the link that we'll put in there. It's uh, cardinalsoul.com forward slash contact. That'll be the contact page on, uh, on Jack's site. If you do have a startup or something that you're interested in or an idea that you want to run by Jack and a business idea, uh, make sure it's a solid idea before you call Jack. You know, don't just call him with a Fakakta idea. You want to give him an idea that would make sense for you maybe related to what you're doing. Uh, please don't, don't abuse my guests. <laughs> Make sure that you use them gently, please. And, uh, and Jack will uh, be able to give you some great ideas, I'm sure, and, uh, and give you some advice. Jack, thank you so much for being on the show and, and sharing your message and your inspiration and everything that you're about. Definitely a worthwhile guest to have on the show today. 
I, I really appreciate you having me. It's been a really great conversation and, and hopefully we'll chat again soon. I, I think we're going to have you back just to talk movies, not about business at all, but let's get you back on the show to talk to you and you, me and Strickland can uh, shoot, shoot the shit about just movies and, and everything else that's in, in Hollywood. Well, well, let me tell you, I mean, I, 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 I have, you, you, you get me started on that. You're not going to get me to stop. <laughs> I have, you know, especially if we get into like movies, related to startups and, and different areas of the business and then movies in general, that'd be phenomenal. Yeah. Hey, I got a, I got a question. What would be a movie that uh, now I have my own answer and I'll give it, I'll give it after you give yours, but what would you say would be a movie that every entrepreneur should watch? Well, so, so I, I think there are several, I'll, I'll give you a quick run through of, of some of the top ones. just just real fast. Sure. So definitely you gotta, you gotta watch the founder. Okay. Just a well done film shows you the evolution of a business from concept the reality, the McDonald brothers explanation of how they optimize the kitchen that, that alone worth the price of admission. Okay. Wow. And I think it also has powerful lessons about customer acquisition, product differentiation, and very importantly, business ethics. Uh, speaking, speaking of ethics, Glenn, Gary, Glenn Roth. Oh my gosh. That was mine. <laughs> That's mine. Yeah. Right. <laughs> First place Cadillac, second place steak knives, third place you're fired. <laughs> You got it. Well, did you know that's actually based on a Pulitzer Prize winning play by, by David Mamet? And, I did, and the I did. cast, the, yeah, the cast, you know the cast, it's incredible. But uh, for, for listeners who may not know, Al Pacino, Alec Baldwin, Alan Arkin, Ed Harris, Kevin Spacey, Jonathan Price, and the great Jack Lemmon. Yeah. And um, now, now, look, I, you know, it, it, is, it is a very male centered film, but uh, I think it takes place in a certain time and in place and uh, a certain kind of sales culture, but some of the aspects of sales, um, I think transcend that time and place and that culture. And so I think that that's pretty amazing. And the final, final film, I don't know if you've seen this one. Uh, it's a gem though. Thank you for smoking. Have you seen that one? No, no, I got to check that. I'm writing it down right now. Thank you for smoking. It's, if, if you have any interest in marketing or the power of words, just an incredibly well done film. Aaron Eckhart, uh, basically he plays uh, a, a spin doctor, uh, a marketing kind of guru who works for the tobacco industry, mm -hmm. right? And what's amazing is you're like, oh, well, you know, probably not a character I'm going to like. But what's amazing is, is you actually end up really liking the character. And, and, and it's how how can you possibly like the character and what he's saying? How is that even possible? A lot of um, sort of very, very interesting ideas and, and the power of words. I'm going to say it again, just the way it's represented. Thank you for smoking um, an incredible film and also a great cast. Uh, JK Simmons was in it. Um, and uh, a number of, I think Maria Bello, if I'm remembering correctly. So just uh, uh, a great, great um movie that you know a lot of people uh nowadays probably don't remember it but it's, it's i'm thinking when it came out and it, it's not that old right Aaron Eckhart, so not that old excellent well geez that was a that was a unexpected gift that i just got at the end of the uh, at the end of the interview i have three new movies that i can uh well two movies that i that i haven't seen yet that i'm gonna uh, that i'm gonna check out nice guy community i would uh, advise you to do the same thanks again jack for being on the show my absolute pleasure Nice guy community, never underestimate the power of nice. Again, special thanks to Jack Plotkin for being on the show today. All of his information, including access to his contact me page, will be right there in the show notes. Steve O'Brien, go ahead and take us out of here. For the nice guys on business, I'm Steve O'Brien. Fill up your week with the nice guys. Have fun storming the castle, boys. <laughs>